focus that I've had here for about five months uh, as a result of the glass that you're taking at the church. I turned this into a sermon series in December. I want to hear some of my sermons uh, dealing with these topics. You can go back to December on Bridge Community Church. Uh, dot com. That's our website, and you can actually listen for more information. Okay, um, so I realized that as I introduce these subjects, that you go, I really am not sure why we would get into this and, and what is it all about. And so, what I'd like to first talk about is this concept of symptoms of um, hurry sickness. And I know my original title was Enriching Your Life for a Lifetime. I still think that's part of the title, but I'm added to it a subtitle of Slowing Down to Being, which dramatically makes no sense. But I think when you get done with today's little talk, you'll understand what I'm trying to get at. Symptoms of hurry sickness. A hurry sickness was defined by Meyer Friedman, and here's how he defines it. Above all, it is a continuous struggle, an unremitting attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things, or participate in more and more events in less and less time, frequently in the face of opposition, real or imagined, from other persons. Hurry sickness is where we begin to feel chronically short of time, where we perform every task faster and we get flustered when encountering any kind of delay or interruption. And so hurry sickness has these qualities that I have on the next slide. Work on it, sorry. I have a... Uh... I got this one. You take care of it. So. Computer shows up. There we go. So things like busyness, clutter, the inability to really listen to others, being stressed out, overworking, superficial. You are like a butterfly flying from flower to flower because you have so many flowers to attend to. And uh, you feel stuck because there's areas of your life you'd like to change, but you don't really have the energy or the time. You feel pressured. You definitely are a multitasker and proud of it because you can do multiple things uh, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> One that may not seem uh, appropriate is weak love. Um, and Basically, love takes time. And if you suffer from hurry sickness, you don't have the time. And sunset fatigue. Does anybody know what sunset fatigue is? Has anybody heard that word? That's not it. <laughs> Well, sometimes get Sunset fatigue is when you come home and you are so stressed out and tired from the day's events that with your loved ones, you have not, nothing in the tank to give. You're, you're empty. Um, and then you feel burnt out. So you also may have irritability, you may be hypersensitive. You may have emotional numbness. Uh, your priorities are out of order. You may want to do what many have during February in Michigan, especially with the weather, escape syndrome, where you want to run away and just go and be somewhere. So uh, one of the things that we see with this is that there is a problem uh, with timefulness. I didn't put that word in there. But timefulness is another word that I have not heard before. And timefulness is where um, you have a sense of having enough time. And those who have hurry sickness don't have enough time. So do you feel like you have enough time? Or would you like to have like three more hours added into the 24 hour 
Yeah. Yes, I no, I want three more hours. You want three more hours? Yeah. Two hours of duty. So if you have hurry sickness, you probably are stressed out. And as you will know, if one person in a family is stressed out, everybody is stressed out. And if there's one person in the workplace that's stressed out, everybody is stressed out. Uh, in my church, if there's one person that's stressed out, the whole church begins to fear. Um, I've spent a lot, I spent almost a year of my life in Africa, uh, there in the villages, and uh, love the different tribes that uh, I've had a chance to uh, become friends with. And, you know, that saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, when one thing happens to one person, the whole village feels it. And so um, that's kind of what happens with hurry sick. So today we want to try to speak to some of that. I signed the one over here. She got it. Yeah, there you go. So why should we consider these five S's, I call them, of slowness, Sabbath, stillness, solitude, and silence? And the next slide shows us uh, why we should think about these five topics. Okay. And by the way, they are separate, but they are interlinked. And you'll find that as I begin to talk about one of the five essays, you'll see that it leads over into the other areas. First, being is more important than doing. There's a reason why Homo sapiens are called human beings and not human doings. But in the sports world, in the work world, in school, it's all about performance. And what happens is we really think more as human doings than human beings. That needs to flip. The five S's are a huge attempt to flip from becoming a performance-based human doing to becoming a human being, where you're living out of the center of your life and out of your heart, as opposed to trying to be a people pleaser uh, perform so that you get a good rating from other people. It's also so that we can become more aware. Uh, for those of you who are Christians uh, or another religion, you want to become aware of your God. But you also want to slow down and get silent to become aware of other people. We have people that come from other um, states in the United States to be trained at my church uh, for ministry. And a leader a few years ago said this, Randy, if you can help the people deal with their junk, and if you can help them become self-aware, we will thank you so much. And so as I train uh, millennials to become future leaders in the Christian world, I help them try to deal with their junk. And one of the biggest things is become self-aware. And I find that self-awareness, you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you know your likes, your dislikes, you know what you can do, what you can't do, you know what your spiritual gifts are, you know what your spiritual love language is, you know all these different things about you. I find that we are really missing in that area. Another is being separate from people. Some of you who have gone through counseling understand the concept of codependency, and it's where somebody is just intertwined with somebody else's life. Slowing down, getting alone, being silent can help you become separate from the people that are impacting and influencing you in your life. One of the biggest things is to be present. Have you ever, uh, what's your name? Kevin. Kevin? Kevin. 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 Have you ever been talking with somebody and uh, just talking like this, and then uh, 
suddenly they go and look over there at somebody and they're talking to them. And, or they pick up, yeah, good one. They pick up the phone and they go, oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it's like you, hello. <laughs> hello, I'm here. What's really sad is I have done this. I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be present, listen, engage, all there. You ever come home from work and sit down with your significant other and you're eating, but you're not there? You ever have your kids, like my oldest when he was four years old, grab my face and say, Dad, listen to me with your eyes. <laughs> so when we have hurry sickness and we're running like crazy, we aren't present. We don't even not smell the roses. We don't see the roses. It's to be rested. You ever make stupid decisions? You want more wisdom? And you want to change? That's why I love what Peter Scavero says. He says, what you do matters, but who you are matters more. And you cannot give what you do not possess. And the state that you are in, and I'm not talking about Tennessee or Michigan or Illinois, the state that you are in is the state that you give to other people. So why should we consider this? It's to be spiritually, emotionally, relationally restored. Why are these so difficult, these subjects that we're looking at here today? The next slide gives us that. Yes, I We'll connect to that in a little bit more. Okay. I'm going to come back to that. Okay. okay. So, why are these hard? It's because of these things. You know what? When um, we're bored, we have become an entertainment society. We just want to be entertained constantly. And to just be still, be alone. I remember when I was in Africa, uh, I was 24 years old, uh, working as a medical missionary in Zaire. And uh, at nine o'clock, uh, our, our electricity went out. So we only had the kerosene lamps. And the missionaries all went to bed. And I, and I was single, and they all went back with their spouses. And, and I'm just sitting there, 24 years old. <laughs> no, no phone. No radio, no TV, no electricity. Computers hadn't been born yet. <laughs> and I went, oh my. And what, what I was reading a Billy Graham book, and Billy Graham said that when you're lonely, become more lonely. And I never understood it until that time. And I realized growing up in Roseville, Michigan, that when I got lonely, when I was like, I just need somebody, phone call, get in the car, drive, and I would connect. I didn't know how to be alone. I, I didn't want to be alone. It's boring. Uh, distractions. Uh, I love what uh, I found in uh, John Homer's book uh, that I'll be addressing throughout this morning and this afternoon. Uh, a study was done a few years ago. The average iPhone user, how many have iPhones? Okay, three quarters of our group. The average iPhone touches their phone, are you ready? 2,617 times a day. <laughs> That's the average. Average. 
two and a half hours over 76 sessions per day. 77% of young adults with nothing to do reach for their phone. Distractions. I read something here, and this is people that actually do this distraction research, and that if you get a phone call, it takes you 25 minutes to recover. And we are just constantly getting distracted. As a result of that, there is no depth to our life. We're not solving issues. We're not changing because we're constantly distracted, constantly entertained, and we don't have enough time to fill up the binging on Netflix or Prime Video. We also are just wanting to feel important. I realize that one of the things that I struggle with, um, does anybody here ever struggle with low self-esteem? Self-image? No? And if I'm busy, I must be important and needed. And some of us just stay hyper busy because we're really dealing with identity issues and trying to make ourselves feel more significant. So those are some of the reasons why it's hard today. It's not easy, but I want to get into these topics. My first one is slowness. Uh, a guy that I'll be reading some of his quotes today, his name is Dallas Willard, he just passed away a few years ago. Uh, and he writes a ton of books on spiritual disciplines. And John Ortberg, who is a Presbyterian pastor, uh, was being mentored by Dallas Willard. And John Ortberg said, I'm really wanting to grow in my life. I'm wanting to change areas. Can you help me? Um, and so there was a long pause at the end of the phone. And finally, and Dallas Willard did this often. He would wait in between these conflicts. And he said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. John Ortberg gave Dallas Willard that kind of look that John gave me when I pulled out John. Uh, anything else? A long pause. And Dallas Willard again simply repeated this statement. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your body. No progress emotionally, spiritually, relationally, even mentally, I think, will take place if your life is just a hurry. We wish our microwaves would hurry up. <laughs> we are impatient mixing our instant coffee. There was a church bulletin that said this, we thank thee Lord for our instant coffee, ready-made cocoa, one minute oatmeal, pop-up waffle, in haste, amen. <laughs> Slow has become a pejorative word in our culture. Slow is bad, fast is good. There were some people, um, some missionaries in Africa going through the jungles and the Africans were helping to lead the way. And they had to really get very far and they simply stopped. And the missionary asked, why aren't we moving? And here's what um, the Africans said to him in translation, we are not moving, we are waiting for our souls to catch up with our bodies. I've always loved that little story. And having been in majority world countries, you guys know what a majority world country is? It's people who primarily speak a different language and live in a different country than us. So it's South America, it's Asia, it's Africa. It's different than Western United States and Western Europe or United States. Majority world cultures, when you're sitting in their home, they are present. They are all in. 
they are engaged and they are not looking at their watches because they don't have a watch. They're not looking at their phone because that would be unpleasant. They're just simply reading. Slowing down. Ronald Wolheiser, a Catholic priest, said, We are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. We are so rushed and so preoccupied, we can't deal with anything. Annie Orland, one of my favorite gals that I've met uh, several times, she was a pastor of a Presbyterian guy out in California, uh, said this about pressure Is doing more important to you than being? Than your pressure is what you're acquiring more important to you than what you're becoming. Than your pressure, are jobs more important to you than relationships? Than your pressure, do you think busyness, speed, and efficiency rank near the top of the list of virtues? Than your pressure, are you ambitious to expose your children to more than most kids get? You're probably pressuring them. Do you have huge expectations with them to achieve in many areas at once? You're pressuring them. You want them to do to be marvelous extensions of yourself. You're pressuring them. And last, if you don't possess deep in your soul an assurance of God's acceptance of you and your family and other people's acceptance of you and your family, then you're pressured and you're pressuring. Trying to justify yourselves, qualify yourselves, promote yourselves can take an awful lot of time, but probably won't change much until you get gripped. One guy said this, I think God's going to come down and pull civilization. Some of those possibilities at the end. Next is Sabbath. How many are aware of the Ten Commandments? Then, and you all know that the, you shall honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy is one of the Ten Commandments. Is the Sabbath being practiced today? Okay. Now, I just want to kind of settle you in. Every time I see the word Sabbath, you hear a guy begin to talk about Sabbath, especially the preacher, it is, oh boy. It's going to be legalistic city. No fun, no game, no cards, no board game. No that is not what I'm going to address whatsoever today. That's not what this is about. But did you know that one third of the verbiage that Moses wrote in Exodus 20 about the Ten Commandments was given to this fourth commandment honor the Sabbath day. One third of the word about the Ten Commandments was all about the Sabbath. He said more about the Sabbath than any other commandment. So here's what blew my mind. The first four commandments are dealing with God, and the last six are dealing with man. No murder, adultery, stealing, covering, lying, all that stuff. And then no idols and all this stuff. Honor the name of the Lord. But what we realized, or what I just realized recently, is that the Sabbath being in the middle of the Ten Commandments is key to keeping the first three commandments and the last five commandments. And this ties in with everything we're talking about speed and rush and haste. That if we're not resting, we have no reserve to give to anybody. We're just running. I don't know about you, but I sinned against my kids when I was rushing. That's when I wounded my kids. That's when I wounded my wife when I'm in a rush. And so this concept of Sabbath is the idea of we need to be resting. We need to honor the Sabbath. 
And I, I'm not going to get into all of this until at the very end, but I just want to encourage you to, to think of ways in which you could begin to make your Sabbath different than what it is now. Next, the stillness. This is probably the hardest to explain. And by the way, these are not easy subjects to talk about. And when you try to build it into your life, I wish I could give you three little steps. This stuff is actually hard to do. It's not easy. And stillness is one of these, what does stillness look like? Wait a minute. Is it like we go on the dance floor? Nice to do a lot of boogie and dancing. Anyway, that was my whole day. Um, can, we, can, we, can, we, can we do that again? No, we're not going to do that. Statue. Can I have a little robot? Is that what stillness is all about? No, that's not what it's all about. Stillness is being um, quiet and still and doing absolutely nothing. Wait, wait, wait. You mean like nothing? No music, no TV, no action, still. They are practicing this in the school system. I don't know if we have any teachers online, but schools are now doing what's called mindfulness. And you can do research on this, but it's become a big thing. Uh, and they're exposing people to it. Mindfulness is the secular version of meditation, which is sort of what stillness is about. Stillness is about, and, and one of the best Bible verses uh, that I know on this is Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be quiet. Let go. Chill. Rest. But it's, for the Christian, it's being meditating upon God and his word and being still before him. There's a guy named Michael Hyatt, and his wife said, you need to read this book by uh, Joy, by Martha Beck called The Joy Diet. And his wife said, you won't agree with everything in the book, but uh, I think you'll like it. The first chapter is entitled Nothing. Nothing. In summarizing the chapter, Beck says, to begin the Joy Diet, you must do nothing for at least 15 minutes a day. He said, I began to do that, and my life was transformed. The book called The Joy Diet? The Joy Diet by Martha Beck. Husbands have known this secret for years, just so you know. Right. We have a, a little drawer. Nothing. When the wife says, what are you thinking about? Nothing. Nothing. But usually that's when they're there in front of the TV going like this with the clicker and flipping through the channel. So I just want to encourage you that being still is doing that nothing. Um, now, all of you have read books at some time. Uh, you know about uh, whiteboards and white space. And in books, there's margins. And, and if you're in advertising and marketing, what you want is a lot of white space. Just use like a one little picture or two, a few words, but have like blank. Because what you're trying to push is going to 